you at lunch? Uh, yeah. You still able to do that? <coughs> All right, we will call the accountability committee to order. Uh, I think we're still one short of a quorum, but we can start as a, a committee, especially since right. Mr. Lara is uh, here this morning with a bill to present. So, Mr. Lara, we're going to let you go ahead and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, I'm pleased to present AB 187, ironically enough, which is uh, joint authored uh, by Assemblymember Smythe. Uh, AB 187 expands the state auditor's current high-risk audit program. Specifically, this bill would allow, not mandate, um, uh, the state auditor to review local governments during the course of her, um, the course of her, the high, of her high-risk program that already currently exists within uh, the auditor's uh, department. Currently, she is, she is only authorized to audit state agencies under this specific program. The purpose of the high-risk audit program is to determine if there are areas in our state that are at high risk of waste, fraud, and mismanagement. In response to the issues surrounding the city of Bowen, my district, the Joint Legislative Audit Committee, which I chair, has held a series of hearings on local government. Laura, let me interrupt you just for Sorry. a sec so we can establish a quorum. So if uh, Kirk would call the roll. <coughs> Dickinson? Here. Garrick? Here. Block? Here. Buchanan? Cook? Here. Fletcher? Grove? Here. Hagman? Here. Huber? Lowenthal? Mitchell? Here. Dr. Pan? Portantino? Here. Okay. I think we have a quorum. Great. Thank you. No problem. At our JLAC meeting in September 2010, um, it was our, our one of our oversight hearings in an effort to improve transparency. The state auditor suggested expanding the high-risk program to our local governments. The current omission of local governments from this program could hamper the ability of the state auditor to provide accurate and complete statewide oversight. It is important to note the auditing local governments is not an expansion of the state auditor's jurisdiction. The Joint Legislative Audit Committee can require the audit, auditor to audit any public created entity at any time. AB 187 simply allows our state auditor to alert the legislature to areas in our government that may be at risk before the issue explodes into another city of Bell. Uh, given the auditor's authority, uh, state auditor's respected work and the current work she is doing with our high risk program, <coughs> this expansion is a natural fit with her ongoing duties. With me today to speak in support and answer any questions you might have about this program is our esteemed state auditor, Elaine Howell. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Ms. Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, for the record, my name is Elaine Howell. I'm the state auditor, and we do absolutely support AB 187. What I thought I would do just briefly for some members who may not be familiar with my office is uh, the high risk program that we currently operate is limited to state agencies. It was a program that was uh, enacted in legislation about four or five years ago, and the intent of the legislation, Senator Speer uh, was the author, a former member of the Joint Legislative Audit Committee, is currently a congressional member was to tr provide some institutional knowledge and some longevity as far as the ability to look at issues over the course of time. So what our high risk program currently does for state agencies is requires us to uh, consult with legislature, with control agencies such as the state controller, the attorney general's office, to look at issues that may be uh, both a state have a statewide impact or looking at departments that may have issues regarding efficiency, waste, fraud, abuse, th those sorts of things. Um, what this bill would do would also allow us to have the same similar type of program for local agencies. As uh, Assemblymember Lara indicated, our statutory authority as far as audits we can conduct we currently have statutory authority to audit any publicly created entity. So that would be a special district, a city, a county, those sorts of things. What this bill does is allows us to uh, look at some of those entities under our high risk authority. And again, it's permissive legislation. So what that means is our statutory responsibilities come first which is the single audit, uh, the audit of the state bar. We now have some responsibilities to audit courts. Um, 
And then the next uh, series of audits that we would do are the audits that are approved by the Joint Legislative Audit Committee. Uh, those again, as, as they are approved, we consider those to be a mandate. And then to the extent we have resources available within our office, uh, we embark on conducting high risk audits or high risk analyses uh, to keep the legislature informed, to educate the administration and really just keep uh, an eye on different departments or issue areas in the state uh, that, again, may be at risk of, of fraud, abuse, but certainly could be waste or inefficiencies as well. So we think this bill um, is an important bill and it would allow my office to, again, provide additional oversight uh, at a statewide level as opposed to being limited, uh, the high risk program being limited to state agencies. Um, if members have any specific questions about work we've done in this area, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, if you'll, if you'll stay there. Uh, is there any other support here this morning uh, for the legislation? Okay, any opposition or concerns? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. I'm Jean Hurst with the California State Association of Counties. We uh, are not opposed to the bill, but we do have some concerns um, about the measure, particularly since local agencies have not been a part of this program uh, previously. Um, because of the situation in Bell, we've been dealing with a number of measures to provide greater sort of state oversight and potential intervention uh, at the local level, uh, should that be deemed necessary. I think what's important uh, for our members is to know what to expect to have some sense of criteria, to have some sense of which uh, uh, state entity is going to come in and uh, provide audit services, and uh, frankly, how those um, practices are gonna be funded. Um, we could easily envision a circumstance, uh, particularly with the new, uh, new authority provided to the controller and some measures that are moving through the legislature where both the state controller and the state auditor could potentially go into a local, a local agency. Uh, we're concerned that that's not an effective use of state resources. We're concerned about the resources that would be required at the local level. And we just wanna um, encourage the legislature to seek some clarity uh, as to uh, sort of who's gonna go in when and under what circumstances. Um, and uh, with that, I think we'd be, we're all for transparency. We've been more than happy to participate with the state, but it's important for us to be able to know what we're getting into uh, sort of beforehand and have that cl have that clarified in the statute. So mm -hmm. we'd appreciate your consideration. Okay. Thank you, Matt Hurst. Um, Matt Cyberling on behalf of the State Association of County Auditors. Again, I'll be brief since we only have a position of concerns as well. Um, not opposing the bill, but uh, living in this new world post bell, uh, we're being inundated with a lot of uh, unfamiliar new proposals and bills that are that are coming our way. Uh, like Jean said, we're, we'd like to work with the author and the sponsor to develop some sort of criteria or expectation on uh, when this new authority could be used. Uh, we're concerned about uh, no reference to who bears the cost of uh, these potential discretionary audits. Uh, and most importantly, we're concerned about how you get off of this list and how you, how you uh, lose this designation if you do gain it as a high risk uh, local agency. Uh, but again, we'd like to work with the author and the sponsor moving forward to uh, help better understand this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Absolutely, Clark, uh, Mr. Chair, we would, we would uh, be more than happy to work with those folks that have concerns and ensure that, you know, as this bill moves forward, we address any issues they might have. Okay, so. thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, Ms. Lowenthal. Thank you for this important piece of legislation. I think we can't have enough transparency in government. Um, my question is for those local jurisdictions that uh, could be very fragile and could be examined by the auditor, uh, do all of them have a whistleblower protection in those jurisdictions? Um, our, our, the California Whistleblower Protection Act that we are responsible for, our, our jurisdiction is limited to state employees. So we would not be able to provide uh, whistleblower protection under the way the act reads right now. I don't know, uh, to be honest with you, what may exist at the local level, but the Whistleblower Protection Act that my office is responsible for, we are limited to, well, actually, it's state employees and now court employees uh, with legislation that was enacted this yeah. year. Uh, but that's, that's the extent of our jurisdiction with regard to whistleblower protection. I would just encourage the author to examine Definitely that aspect look into of that. love and I'll work with you on that. Definitely, appreciate that Thank comment. Thank you.
concern. Mr. Mr. Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, uh, welcome. Thank uh, you. Having served on the uh, Joint Legislative Audit Committee and uh, actually had a uh, at a request of my own personally, I'll identify a district audited by you and an mm -hmm. excellent job and found what we were, what was brought to our attention. Uh, I think that this piece of legislation, Mr. Lara, dovetails well into what should be um, the kind of permissive, as identified, uh, authority of the auditor to pursue that. Uh, a couple of items, though, that come to mind. First, um, could you clarify the definition, as you understand it, uh, from your office, please? in the auditor's office, that is, high-risk government agency, a little more definition of that, and also, or clarity for myself and maybe some committee members, mm -hmm. and your resources that you have now. How many audits do you do a year? How many individuals do you have? And what is your um, present budget annually? Sure. Um, the, the definition of high-risk entity, uh, as, as defined in this bill, is, is, does mirror what already exists in statute for the high-risk program that we have for state agencies. And there's a variety of things. It could be uh, a situation where there are concerns about fraud or abuse, mismanagement, inefficiencies. And we have, and I know some of the concerns, we have criteria that we've laid out in our in our high risk reports relative to state entities, um, a variety of things that we would look at. I mean, I can go through some of those, but it's really looking at um, historical trends. I mean, what we did with state agencies, two state agencies, for example, that are on our high risk list at this at the uh, under the existing program, is the Department of Corrections. Looking based on audit work we've done in the past, based on looking at their expenditures over the course of five or ten years, their expenditures have increased significantly. Uh, the, based on the audit work we've done, we've seen inefficiencies. So a combination of all of those factors led us to say we need to have the Department of Corrections on our high risk list. Another one is the Department of Health Care Services and Public Health, where significant state and federal dollars are expended by those particular departments. So again, it could be uh, something where you're just looking at the risk of misuse of, of state or federal monies. Um, another area is if there are issues that are uh, cause for public health and safety risks, uh, to the public, to the uh, citizens of the state, that would be something else that we would contemplate as one of the factors to consider in determining whether s uh, an entity or an issue is a high risk issue in California. Um, relative to the bu budget for my office, um, we actually asked for an augmentation this year, but my budget in the, uh, historically it's $17 million. Um, I have about 105 auditors on staff right now. Typically, we put out between 30 and 40 audits a year, and that includes the statutory work that we do as well as the audit committee work. It includes some follow-up work that we do, um, as I'm sure you're familiar with that process where we do follow up on, on audits we've done in the past where we're not satisfied with the implementation of recommendations. So um, in the last year, to be quite frank with the committee, we haven't been able to do a lot of high-risk work because we were doing all of our statutory work, our, our audit committee work, and Recovery Act work. We considered Recovery Act high risk. So you could say we're doing high risk, but we had to kind of shift gears and work on that. Plus Proposition 11, uh, creating the redistricting commission. We really had to redirect some resources there. But my vision and my goal would be to have the high risk program an ongoing uh, part of our work on an annual basis because I think what we've done in the past has been very beneficial and, and successful in identifying areas and keeping a pulse on certain departments and certain issue areas and being uh, a resource to new administration coming in and certainly to the legislature. Um, so I hope that answers your questions. It, it does as usual. You're very um, complete in your response. Um, you didn't identify if you were, though, if you were successful in getting your augmentation. Well, it actually was approved by both budget subcommittees, uh, but it's you know uh, the budget still as is. Uh, uh, if there is the one one uh, um, committee or uh, one entity in the state government that uh, should have additional assets mm -hmm. at this time, I think that yours, having uh, worked with you and the Joint, audit uh, Joint Legislative Audit Committee and your office um, in these times of tight economic uh, challenges, we uh, 
need to make sure every dollar is utilized and uh, root out all waste, fraud, and abuse. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. We'll take that as an encouraging sign. <laughs> and Mr. Hagman, then Ms. Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I do have the experience of being on your committee the last couple of years, and I appreciate that. And I do have some concerns, um, but I do like the general approach of us having our oversight duties. So maybe you could help answer some of these questions. Um, when we do uh, audit currently on a state agency, we use your funds augment from the state funds to do the mm -hmm. audit. Mm -hmm. Are you still intending to use state funds to do the audits on local entities? Or are you plan to basically build the local entities for those audits? How would that how would that function work? Well, uh, my understanding at this point, and I think that's something that can be discussed as the bill moves moves forward, hopefully. Um, but the way the high risk program works right now is the state the state entity that we would be in looking at would essentially reimburse my office. There's a process in the state called pro rata where my staff bill their hours. If they're working at the Department of Corrections, they're essentially billable hours. And, and Department of Finance has essentially a cost allocation where the costs of the audit work that we've done at Corrections is charged back to Corrections. Same thing if we're doing federal work, that those hours that my staff incur to look at the administration of federal programs is billed back to the federal government. So I think it's a, it's a decision that needs to be made as to whether or not the general fund is going to pay for it or if we are out and looking at local entities, whether or not it's a, a reimbursement uh, situation as far as those entities reimbursing the state for, for our audit work. What, what I'm concerned with, and I, and I think you, Mr. Lahr, you need to address this at some point in the future, of how that's going to work. I don't want this to become a jobs program for the auditor's office, no disrespect. No, absolutely. But yeah. you have to have a certain yeah. criteria here before you go to local counties or entities or school boards that are already f fighting for every dime they have right now to keep things afloat and then say, look, I'm going to put four or 500000 or a million dollars of audit work on your local entity if there's not sufficient justification. That's one thing we do at the joint audit committee is we at least have to prove up a reason to have that audit. If this bill goes through as is, we don't need an authority from an independent elected body. You could basically make your own criteria, go audit, and then bill the recipient. And that we've had other boards that kind of grew out of that, our resource board, CARB, others that really don't have legislator oversight anymore, and they kind of taken a mine of their own. And I'm, I'm just concerned. I have never seen the evidence from, from your department on this. But unless you craft this correctly and put some kind of limitations on that, I feel for the local entities may just feel like you know, I got the controller office coming down on me. I have the, the uh, state auditor's office coming down, and we're doing everything according to what our locals want to do. It may not be the same that other entities would do, but, you know, from the outside perspective. So that needs, to me, there needs to be a, a checks and balance process put in there that we could sit there and maybe appeal process from the city before you initiate the audit to come to the legislature, come to local government, come to a oversight and say, there's no evidence for this audit and we don't want to have it come out to us. Some kind of thing in there that, that we could maybe just put that stop in there. And so. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll definitely more than willing to look at that issue and, and make sure we keep you abreast. And then last question I have too. Um, <coughs> would this be, well, I actually have two more, I'm sorry. Only for state and federal dollars going to local entities, would it be local the, the, you know, property tax dollars and income as well that you have authority to audit? And then that's one question. Um, and then the second, last one is how would the controller's office also be fit in there? Because they do have authority to go in and look at books as well. So how do you see those corresponding or working together? Well, you know, in, in my opinion, quite frankly, you know, the state auditor is our nonpartisan independent entity that performs these audits already. We're just, we're, you know, giving her the permission to, to do this work. Um, as as opposed to you know my good friend John Chung who's political and and is partisan and so I thought it was important to you know bring this forward and give this authority to the state auditor who's our independent entity to do this um, and from if, if you want to answer the mm -hmm. the high risk authority sure I, I I actually have a couple of comments the bill and it's similar to our existing high risk we have a, we have a notification requirement in the legislation that's currently with regard to state agencies. We have to notify JLAC mm -hmm. if we've identified an agency as high risk. The other issue uh, that was raised by uh, in some of the concerns is, is the controller going to be in there at the same time the state auditor? We don't want that to happen mm -hmm. um, because 
whenever we conduct an audit, regardless of whether it's a joint legislative uh, audit committee audit that's been approved or a statutory audit, what we're required to do under, under standards, and it, and it in fact makes just good business sense, is to determine whether or not an entity has been audited recently. Can we rely on that work? Is there an auditor already in there? Is the controller in there? The city of Bell, I got a lot of questions from legislative uh, members and staff. Are you guys going down to Bell? It's like, well, the state controller's in there, the AG's in there. Not sure it would it would make sense for my office to go in there. But honestly, we wouldn't have been able to go in without the audit committee directing us to. Under this high-risk authority, we would be able to notify JLAC that there are concerns regarding a particular city or county, and we've crafted uh, an audit scope of what we think we're going to do. Let the audit committee know, and we could go in and do that. Um, but we certainly want to avoid... Uh, any kind of duplication and, and overly burdening uh, any city or county or local district yeah. that, that's being audited. Under the current situation that we do now, if, if a member or if a member initiates an audit request, mm -hmm. um, JLAC can approve it and you have to schedule it in. Um, this will basically take out that legislature referring it to the audit committee for a local entity. And is it something that maybe you could just word it where you want to self-refer but get the okay so in your weekly or you know in your bi-weekly committee hearing say hey we, we identified these three we gave them notice two weeks ago they're not here today this is why we want to go audit them and it's almost like a consent calendar so you don't have to have a mm -hmm. hearing but some kind of this before the fact that before you initiate and mm -hmm. have you know sure. I do I am concerned about Bell I mean we all from local government know that that's the, the nominally not the normal thing in local governments that they're not like that generally but it was something to jump on the bandwagon. And everybody, like you said, the AG's office, the controller's office, the legislature had a bunch of bills. Everybody wanted to go after that situation because it was politically, you know, timely for that. Mm -hmm. And I I don't want to push all those burdens on the good governments that are doing well and have them <coughs> incur those expenses unless there's actually justification to go in. If there is, by all means, we, it's our oversight duty. We need to go um, check them out and make sure they're doing things to protect the public. But there should be some criteria that we at least all agree upon, and that checks and balances are there. And it's not really spelled out. I know you have the high risk program, but that's with state agencies. So you have that internal battle that, you know, the director could go to the governor, the governor could come back here, they could talk to the legislature. That communication line is pretty open, where it's not as open with local governments to the state legislature all the time. Okay. We'll continue to, to work on the bill and ensure that we put those checks and balances. Uh, I agree with I agree with the. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Ms. Buchanan. I I have two questions. Actually, more than two questions. But the, the first is of the chair, and I uh, apologize for I didn't read this till last night. And since we we're meeting at nine o'clock, but we've never been a policy committee that's actually had bills come through us. So, and I didn't see any recommendations. So, are we? Voting on this? Are we hearing that? Are we just hearing it we're, as informational? We're, or we're voting on this. Okay. All right. I, I just didn't know that we had to change there. So, I've been one of the biggest supporters of your office, yeah, I know. but I have serious concerns with this. Okay. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're you talked about your budget historically at seventeen billion, but we no. we just I wish had it a, were seventeen billion. Yeah. Million. <coughs> million, right? No, this but we just had a significant increase that we gave you for yes, that's next correct. year. So, and I forget what that it's is. Eight million dollars. Eight million. So we've increased it to twenty-five million. The cost of those audits aren't reimbursed by other agencies. That's general fund money that we use to fund your office, correct? Well, some of that augmentation will be a split because if we're auditing a state agency, right. then that that's uh, that state agency. It could be a special funded agency. Uh, for example, right. looking at the recycling program we did last year. Um, but there certainly are going to be some general fund dollars expended to conduct some high risk work or work that we do at the no, local but level. The, the 25 million is general fund money that gets spent. It's so a, no, so it, there's a split between general, the portion of our budget is general fund right. and a right. portion of our budget is it's called the central cent services cost right, recovery. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. um, this is my concern, okay? Mm -hmm. When you, w if you think about all the work that our state agencies do, and you know the 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 fact that your your um, depart your area is taking on more responsibility mm -hmm. because we've talked about you know where we're going with information technology and all these other areas, you know historically the purpose of your of your um, auditing staff has been to make sure that our state agencies are running well, and we're not keeping up with that right now, which is why we're augmenting your budget by 
50 percent. Mm -hmm. And so now we're talking about taking on all of the local agencies on top of that. And how many cities, counties, special districts do we have in this state? I mean, you, you, I am sure you must know because we're, you're, you want to add them to that responsibility. How many? So 5,100 local agencies. I mean, I think one is that sort of, I think, can make the people of California give them sort of a false sense of comfort that all of a sudden we have an, a, a state auditor over seeing those to make sure there's no waste, fraud, and abuse when we're trying right now just to make state government operate more efficiently and make sure that it's doing all that it can do. Mm -hmm. And we have the, con the controller's office, which I, maybe it is elected on a political basis, but I don't think the controller goes after different entities on a political basis. I mean, if you take a I'm look not, at- I'm not saying that. I know, but, but if you take a look at the, at the work that his office has done, when he, there's been questions whether it is Bell, and they did, it, and we had him testify here. They did an excellent job with that analysis. Or um, more recently, they put out a report on um, uh, redevelopment agencies or whatever. But I think the controller's office does an excellent job, and all the documentation goes there, as with the attorney general's office. So now we're creating a whole nother entity, and one is I don't know how. You know, given where you are at staffing level, how you can possibly be an expert on all the different um, uh, cities and what what happens there on on school districts, on all your different special districts there, and and still, I mean, you, we're either going to you know increase the size of your your auditing capability by tenfold, or you know we're, we've got some unrealistic expectations here, and so. I think what should happen is that you should have authority, but it should be based on being referred by the controller or the attorney general or, or even a, you know, whether it's a legislator or someone locally, they should be asking you to go in. But I, I just don't know how we do it. And when we're, when, we're expand, when we're spending more money, when we're, you know, trying to keep up with what we're doing, I, I just don't see how this makes sense. And, that's where you know my concern is, and that's why, you know, I have a I have a problem supporting it. I, I think you should have the authority to go in, but it should be based on referrals. I just don't know how, how you can you know realistically, mm -hmm. right, stay on top of all that. Well, you know, let me just say that um, this doesn't mean that we're the state auditor all of a sudden is now going to be in every city, in every county, in every special district, and and quite frankly, to me. Uh, whether it's at a local level, at a, at a special district, or a state level, taxpayer money is taxpayer money. And ensuring that is being spent in a way that's expeditiously and it's honestly, I think it's imperative for us, especially coming from my district. And now we're seeing the city of Montebello facing these same issues. Uh, I think the more um, oversight we get in terms of protecting taxpayer money should be, quite frankly, a priority. Um, and that's, you know, kind of the nature of the bill. And I, I would love to get your ideas and, and maybe continue talking as this bill moves, moves forward uh, because I think, you know, you, you did bring some, some concerns and, you know, uh, I look forward you know, to talking. And how, how would the audit, out of 5,100 agencies, how would the auditor know to go into your district? The auditor is not getting any reports from your district, right? Is someone doing a newspaper clipping? How, do, how does the auditor know that there's a problem in so your city? The way we would, would go about this, first of all, it is permissive. It would just give us the authority to do something. It, I wouldn't see it as a responsibility to go out and audit 5,100 entities. But we would do it similar to the way we, we do it with state agencies based on the work that we've done, because we do work. We're out in counties right now looking at child protective services. We've been out and looked at temporary workers. So we're, we audit at the county level quite frequently based on audit requests based that come through the audit committee. And, you're, and um, that's right. They're right. coming through there or they're dealing with state agency Correct. funds. So right. there's, that, there's that nexus there. You don't have the same kind of nexus. With this bill, the only thing that's in the bill currently is a notification to the audit committee that we have a concern about a particular local entity uh, that may have, have issues of risk as far as efficiency, waste mismanagement. The other thing that we would have to do. But my question there is, how do you have that concern? 
what report, what information are you getting to cause that concern? Right, and some of it would be based on information, as the bill says, in consultation with the controller's office, with the attorney general's office. What we did when we enact, uh, implemented our state program was talking to legislative committees, pol both policy committees and budget committees, if there were issues that were raised in that, in that arena, uh, related to a particular state agency. So it would come from, a, we would have to consult a variety of sources. You're absolutely correct, because I can't sit in my office and say, oh, you know, this week I think I want to audit El Dorado County, because I live there. Um, that's not what the intent is. The intent is to try to do some kind of risk assessment and determine entities that may be at risk um, and then notify the audit committee that we have concerns here how and we have resources available, so we think we need to go in and take and a how look. How are you going to do that risk assessment on 5,100 local agencies? Well, I, I, again, I don't know that we would be able to do it on 5,100. I mean, we would have to capture information. We'd have to look at trends. Um, you would need to do some analytical in analyses to determine whether there's an entity if it expenditures. Uh, all of a sudden jump in a particular arena, that's a red flag. It may be, may be appropriate, but it may be a red flag. But the controller's getting the expenditures and all the that The controller does get that information, that's correct. the controller should be, should be looking at that. And I would, I would argue that, uh, I come from school districts, but your expenditures can look very different in a rural or suburban or, mm -hmm. or, sure. or urban school district. And, and so, so you elect, I believe you elect local people to make decisions. I believe you should have as much transparency as possible. I think, you know, some of what the controller's doing and requiring more information online makes sense. But for me to support this bill, I truly should believe you have audit authority at, at the request of the controller, the, the, uh, um, the attorney general, uh, a legislator. I, I think they should be requesting you to do that audit. I just don't see how, it, you know, when, we, when we're not keeping up with all we should be doing at the state level, expanding, you know, the scope to include 5,100 local agencies just doesn't make sense to me. And, and I say that, like I said, I've been one of your biggest oh, fans. Oh, no, I, I understand um, that. But, but at this point in time, when, we're take, when we've got a budget, you know, that, that's limited, and, and I, you know, I just think, I don't think it's realistic, and I do believe that, you know, if you read this bill, I'm, as a public, a member of the public, I'm looking at it thinking, okay, now we have an additional level of oversight, and we really don't have an additional level of oversight. We have, you know, so that, that's where I am. Okay. Uh, any other uh, comments or questions from committee members at this point? Mr. Vice Chair. Just, just to dovetail to my colleague, Mr. Buchanan's, it, this is a permissive bill that, that of codifies the fact that you can, when necessary, through whistleblower um, referral request of a member, uh, if there is sufficient evidence or reason to justify an audit, that you can, you now have permission to engage in that. Um, that's I share some of your same concerns that the. Okay. Bill says, well, I, I'm reading in the, if I can go back, but it, um, uh, it, it talks about, it, this, this bill gives, it doesn't, it doesn't give them, um, it doesn't have them, it, it, it gives them permission to, but it also um, creates um, uh, the authority. So we're going to expand the office, but in terms of personnel and authority. To, to go out and, and do their own auditing or detecting. So it's not where they're going in as a referral at, as, uh, from a state legislator or someone else. Uh, well, I, I it, believe they've worked in, in that capacity in the past, and it, there is the, the famous um, provision here on uh, line three, page two, the state auditor may establish a high-risk local government agency audit program for the purpose of identifying, auditing, and issuing reports on any local government agency. I, I, I'm concerned, like you are, about the, fall, the sense of, uh, false sense of uh, a suddenly a giant investigative arm, but I, I read this more as one that um, expands or creates a permissive um, action on their part when mm -hmm. something uh, triggers a necessary response. So, are, well, I read it as expecting the auditor to have a um, uh, high-risk local government uh, component of their 
of their agency. So um, if 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 we're only if they're only doing it on referral, that's that's one thing. But if 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 well, let, let, let's find out what the authors right, are. What because the the conversation we've had here is is the auditor telling us that they would be looking at different reports and deciding where they wanted to go with that. Let's find out what the the author's intention is. So I, I, I think we, we, can, we can all read the bill, uh, but we may be in Right, and again, let me just stress this is completely permissive. I mean, this is all the bill does. It just gives the, the auditor the permission to do so. So, I mean, but I'm willing to, to work with the members and, and, the, and the committee so chair. So you've got a chance to, to clarify your intention, right. which is to right. give permission. Right. To the to the Absolutely. state auditor. Oh, oh. Clarify where that permission is yeah. originated. Okay, Mr. Mr. Hagman. I think that the only thing here is t twofold way I see it. One, who's going to pay for the audits, and two, how do you start on? And um, nor traditionally, it's been referred by the legislature, or from through the JLAC process, uh, through someone coming bringing a problem to our attention. Um, I think. There's experience from, you know, obviously the controller's office, attorney general. There could be multiple different referrals, but I think one simple what, what I was looking for a check and balance is go ahead and do the initial assessment like we would under this normal circumstances, but then just have a, a hearing with the JLAC, you know, to say, hey, these are the four or five areas that we're looking at. That would include part of your notice anyway to the area. You could still bring that notice. These are the six or seven entities that we feel that we need to go check on our own, but have your JLAC committee um, give a stamp of approval, so to speak. Right. And that will still give the, aid, the the entities that have the concern or the been put on that watch list the ability to come okay. into us as a public hearing, uh, so to speak, before the investigation or the audit actually started. If you had that simple amendment, that would probably do both what you're trying to do. One, the quicker authority to go out and do things as you hear things outside of your normal committee and as you're picking up things through other sources, you can still self-referral that audit right. up, which is the same way as your high-risk program to the state, but at the same time it gives that check at the committee level to sit there and say, yeah, I'm hearing something different from my constituency or the, the entities right. I represent. And it gives that at least that public forum here. And also you can establish at that time what your estimate hours would be and what your cost may be. So at least that's in public. That's in the open before. It's not like after the fact I'm going to bill you, but it's up front and f forward. And that's kind of vetted before that audit actually stops. And that kind of keeps the process smooth and quick, but same still has that checks and balance. So it's just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and I think I could support that. Provided that we're not taking, that we're not adding additional funding, and that we're not adding additional staff or taking away from your current. I mean, I right. think your current budget and your current staff, since we're not keeping up with what we need to be doing, ought to be focusing on that. So if it's sure. referred and they approve it, and there's an additional allocation of funds for that, I can support that. But I can't. I, I can't support creating a, a you know, ex having a, a significant expansion. Of, of staff and well, dollars. The, the, re the resources are a separate question from what's in this bill. And this bill does not address that. Right. So, uh, Dr. Pan. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I, I just uh, thank you, um, Mr. Miller, for bringing this before us. Um, I, I do share some of the same concerns that uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Member Buchanan, but I, I think that uh, Senator Member Hagman brought up a good point uh, because uh, the way why I, how I read it is that you know you identify. You know, it was the identify part, uh, where he basically it looked like, um, and you know that uh, the auditor would uh, basically you would uh, self-refer, and the basis was actually uh, wasn't clear in terms of saying you would identify him as high risk based on weakness identified by an audit, and I think uh, it, it would be uh, appropriate for maybe a little more oversight by JLAC that you'd bring that to. JLAC for review and also for you know looking at the financial implications of further pursuing that and then getting signed off on that uh, before moving forward I think would probably be a little more appropriate just to both in terms of not only resources uh, but also from a policy point of view to be sure that the uh, legislature is in the loop on what you're you're looking at and and where and where you're planning to go and and being sure that uh, there's appropriate oversight so I, th I think that would be certainly um, uh, make me more comfortable with this bill thank you and uh, that's uh, something that I can agree to to work on and you know we'll work with mr. Hagman's office to ensure that you know, we make that process I agree Ms. Mitchell I'd like to move the bill all right we have a second. motion and a second on the bill uh, mr. cook yeah uh, when I read the bill I had uh, some concerns after reading the comments um, 
uh, from the county. Uh, and uh, I appreciate uh, Ms. Buchanan uh, raising some of those issues. I think all of us that come from local government or what have you, you hear the word audit and you get very, very nervous just because of the, the meaning of it. And uh, of course we all do taxes and I won't go there. But, uh, and this is a necessary evil that, uh, <laughs> sorry, Nate, sorry, I didn't mean to. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> <That's selling. laughs> I thought you guys liked my office. No. I, I do, we do, and you're from New England, so I. That's right, Red Sox. <laughs> so okay. okay. I, uh, coming back, we're coming I, back. Well, once again, I just want to say, I, I think there's been a great discussion today that <laughs> as long as uh, the author and I, I've, I've gotten that, that, uh, uh, you look for clarifying language or amendments or in the form of amendments so that everybody knows exactly what the rules of the game are because it, it, the, these things uh, can be very, very traumatic to everyone involved. And uh, before we drop the hammer on something like that, uh, I think we gotta, I think, spell it out a little bit more. So I will support the, the, uh, the bill uh, with the understanding that there is gonna be uh, uh, corrective uh, language in the future. Thank you. We, other comments or Dodgers. questions? <laughs> oh, Mr. Lara, would you like to? I respectfully ask for your vote. Well, I, I would uh, suggest that uh, after this discussion, we may never be referred another bill. <laughs> uh, Ms. Mitchell? Quick question of the chair. So we're talking the um, suggestions made by Mr. Hagman and others will be taken up at another point, Mr. Lara. Yes, we're not going to attempt to. So the point. motion won't be we're, as amended. We're, the, the motion is on the bill as before us. Got it. The chair's recommendation is to do pass to, to appropriations. I understand Mr. Lara had to have made a commitment to work with members right. who've raised concerns, and I and I would add, I'd ask you to work with the committee Absolutely. staff. I, uh, the chair shares a number of the concerns that, that have been articulated, and I, I won't repeat them. Uh, but uh, the bill before us is is what we what we have in print uh, right. with uh, the author's uh, commitment to take up the suggestions and work through these issues as the Absolutely. bill. Absolutely, I commit to do that, Mr. Chair. Advances. We'll work with your office. Okay, Any, anything else? All right, uh, let's call the roll. Do pass to appropriations, um, 187, Dickinson? Aye. Garrick? Aye. Block? Aye. Buchanan? Cook? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Grove? Hagman? Huber? Mm -hmm. Lowenthal? Aye. Mitchell? Aye. Dr. Penn? Portantino? Aye. 11 ayes that uh, do pass to appropriations. Bill, bill is out. Thank you. Thank you, members. Okay. okay, our other item this morning, uh, our recommendations arising out of our hearing related to, s to special districts and uh, you have a revised set of uh, recommendations. Let me make just uh, a couple um, uh, comments um, as we consider these. Uh, we have uh, reduced the, the recommendations to try to focus on, on those items uh, that we um, felt had the, had the most value to uh, the legislature, to members of, of this committee and looking at future policy uh, making options. Uh, the questions could be addressed uh, by ongoing research or, or um, that could be addressed by ongoing research or legislation have, have been uh, removed. Uh, we've had discussions with the uh, stakeholders uh, and we want to thank them for their, their uh, comments and contributions to uh, these refinements. There are some parallel uh, activities uh, going on and therefore we have um, not included these uh, recommendations that were previously in the in the draft uh, because of, of the parallel uh, uh, activities including the special districts association survey survey and an online mapping tool that they've uh, described in the Cal LAFCO study of, um, of barriers to to reorganization um, the objective here is to try to focus on work that would be uh, useful and beneficial uh, 
um, to the committee and uh, to the members uh, generally uh, and to find um, recommendations that uh, have uh, consensus among um, committee members. So uh, that's, the, that's the effort here. And um, with that, if there are comments or questions, the chair would entertain them. Mr. Garrick? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair, Mr. Chairman, for uh, the opportunity and for bringing this back. Uh, I want to thank uh, the committee staff for meeting with the stakeholders who uh, have uh, expressed concerns uh, throughout the process as to the direction of this uh, bill. And uh, also thank you for paring down the recommendations. Um, Unfortunately, I, I still have some hesitation and, and find it difficult to support the recommendations for a couple reasons. First, um, that uh, we as individual elected officials, assembly members, have the ability individually to call on the LAO to investigate and report back to us. And it's really um, nothing new, should I say, or necessary for us as a body here as a committee to um, vote on something like this and then uh, for us to formally I guess, uh, propose that the LAO does what any of us individually could request. Second, to get specific, the two points uh, regarding uh, that were recommended uh, that currently um, we know the answer to the first one, which is regarding remedies available for special districts and identifying there, those are identical to those of cities and counties. Um, identifying the ability of special districts, for example, in financial problems to file Chapter 11 under the Federal Bankruptcy Code. And the other is that the California uh, Debt and Investment Advisory Commission already collects, maintains, and provides comprehensive information on all of the state's and local uh, debt authorization issuances or uh, out there, outstanding debts. And it serves as a statistical clearinghouse. So I'm not sure that I guess I, I'm either cons both concerned about the direction that this may be headed beyond what the uh, words just say, the possible intent of, of forcing or, or trying to, um, let's say, um, encourage, beyond encouraging, the special districts in some cases uh, to combine when they already have that ability and um, the actual items that we are addressing here that already exist and that we have the answers to. So I'm at this time very reluctant to support this going forward. Mr. Uh, let me just add, I understood your last comments to be directed at 2B. Yes, regarding uh, okay. 2B, regarding the California Debt Investment Advisory Commission collects, maintains, and provides comprehensive information on all of the state's local debts and that already. And so that, that just is part of what this bill seems to be addressing and it is already being done by a entity that that commission okay and you had a f your earlier comment had to do with uh, the uh, remedies available to special districts as they relate to uh, filing for chapter 11 if they are chapter 9 excuse me um, if they are in federal uh, or in any form of bankruptcy okay uh, okay I just wanted to make sure that you're uh, And, and I think that bo both of those uh, actually, to a certain extent, mirror our discussion we've just had on the, on the, the bill that was uh, before us. While uh, it, it may seem that there are uh, agencies or institutions or even remedies uh, available, uh, it's, it's, it's not clear that, uh, that those operate to give the public the greatest assurance that there'll be continuity of service and financial stability. So I think that's, um, for example, uh, the agency or agencies responsible in the event of the special district cannot meet its financial obligations. What, what happens if, if a reclamation district, for example, no longer has financial capacity to maintain its, its levies? Who, if anyone, has uh, either the authority or the ability to, to, to step in to remedy that, that situation. Bank bankruptcy is not, a, is not a very satisfactory uh, path to take when you're looking at the risk of, of levies failing, just, just as a hypothetical. So I think that's part of what we were trying to aim for here was, I is there anything? I if there is, fine. If, if there isn't, should we be considering from a policymaking perspective creating something that, that would 
fill the gap in those kinds of instances. Okay. Other, others? Ms. Grove? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, as Mr. Garrick recommends, will not be a, uh, I will be opposing these recommendations. Um, while I appreciate the effort and work completed by the stakeholders um, through a series of meetings, and especially one recently while I was in Texas, um, I recognize that changes have been made, and but I still have serious concerns with the tone and the perceived intent of the remaining recommendations. At the last hearing, Ms. Buchanan, and I thank you very much for your participation in that, made several good points pertaining to the limitations of the proposed LAO study in that the focus was only on special districts and not truly making a comparison with the way cities and counties deliver services and the way the special districts deliver services. And if we're not going to ask for a true comparison of the cost of delivery and the services being delivered by way of both special districts and counties, I think that the recommendations are misleading. Um, not only do the recommendations appear to be leading toward the consolidation, I think there's already a way for them to locally consolidate if they need to consolidate. Um, and that's already a mechanism that we have in place and I don't think the state should be involved in that. And then there's also language used in Section 1A um, uh, with the consolidation issue. And I can't help but feel that this is um, a witch hunt for special districts and I, I can't support the recommendations. And again, without a clear comparison um, between cities and counties and special districts and the quality of service for the cost of delivery of services, I can't um, support these um, recommendations. Also, I would like to make known that um, as a meeting took place um, and I asked to be requested to be at that meeting and ask if it could be rescheduled when I was in town and through a series of phone calls through leadership through Mr. Garrick's office speaking to you directly on the phone, um, that still was not granted. And being a part of this committee that um, promotes transparency and telling my staff that being at that meeting would not be a good use of my time, um, I thought was really um, not appropriate. Um, I would have liked to participate in that meeting so that um, I could f hear firsthand the stakeholders' um, issues that they have along with um, uh, the staff's recommendations as well. And so I asked for that meeting to be delayed until we could return from that trip and, and um, it was not. And I don't think that was appropriate. So I will not be supporting the recommendations. Just a couple things. Um, I, I do, I do want to thank Ms. Buchanan and Dr. Pan who uh, accepted my offer to offer comments uh, and uh, they were the two committee members who put suggestions and comments in writing. And so I, I appreciate that and I want to I want to acknowledge that they were the only two who did so uh, and I want to uh, I appreciate Ms. Grove you're raising the point about including cities and, and counties um, that was discussed as a as a possibility including them it it would have enlarged the scope of this considerably representatives of, of cities and counties did not appear um, before this committee and have a chance to uh, make any comments uh, at all. So uh, the chair's judgment was that in that instance, it, it would be unreasonable to in include them. That doesn't mean that there's not an issue that can be examined of cost of service delivery among different units of, of local government. It just go exceeds the, the scope of what we heard with respect to the subject matter of the hearing um, that we held. Um, second point, I think the issue you've raised about access to meetings, we've had discussions about that and uh, we don't need to take up the committee's time for any further discussion of that. Uh, Ms. Mitchell. Yes, sir. <laughs> Ms. Buchanan. I, could you refresh for me why we're doing this? I, I, I could. The, the, the um, feeling was uh, going in that, that there might be opportunities for uh, realizing efficiencies in the operation of governmental units. Special districts are one of those instances where in many cases we, we have special districts providing identical services in somewhat geographic, in, in somewhat different geographic areas. Uh, as an, just as an example, not to be inclusive. The, the notion was to try to get a sense of, of whether there were opportunities for reducing expense to taxpayers and increasing efficiency of service by, by looking at, uh, at opportunities for uh, streamlining or, or consolidation, firstly. Secondly, there, there's a longstanding issue of, of public awareness of, of special districts. We heard testimony in the, 
in the hearing, as I'm sure you recall, from the professor who studies special districts that un until he saw a ballot about a port district, he didn't even know he lived in a, in a port district. Uh, you may recall uh, Mr. Bradford testified that he hadn't voted in a, in a uh, race in 16 years for a, a special district in which um, he resided. So part of the focus of the, of the hearing was to examine whether or not there would be uh, opportunities for I increased public awareness, consciousness, and participation, and transparency of, of special districts. So those are just two of the things that, that generated the hearing in the first place. I mean, not knowing that you have a special district could be an indicator that the special district's doing things really well. It, it because it if they're on the front line, if they're in the if they're in the front page of the paper, chances are there's a problem, right? So that does that isn't necessarily an, an indicator that it's good or bad. It just means that that we have special districts of which the average person isn't aware because they're they're getting the service from it. I, I wouldn't want to assume because in a public agency no. or, or an elected official no. appears on the front page that means there's a problem. Well, no, but I, it's, it, <laughs> <laughs> there's, you're right, I used to, I had someone ask me one time on school boards, you know, when I actually was starting to run, they said, well, do you have, I said, no, I've always considered if I'm doing my job, the students are on the front page of the paper and not, and not me. But, but at any rate, um, I guess my concern still, and, and because if, if you want to talk about opportunities for consolidation, I'm, I'm going to go back to one of my suggestions, and it wasn't, my suggestion wasn't to look at cities, to look at cities, but if you're going to consolidate and have someone else deliver that service, the question is, is that service, if it's delivered by the other, a different entity, is it, are there, is it delivered more efficiently now, is, does it cost less, what's happening? And oftentimes, you know, I had, I had people from a special district uh, that I represent in talking with me this week, and, and actually, it's a great division between the city and the special district. They complement each other. They, you know, it actually takes budget pressures off. And I, I just don't know how you make a good recommendation if you don't know, if you're not truly comparing apples to apples, and if you're just looking at, at half of the, of the picture there. And, I, and um, you know, and, and given where we are with resources or anything else, I mean, the LAO, I have respect for them, but too often they're, they take a look at things from a 10,000 foot view and, and you know, we, unless you get down into the, the weeds, so to speak, you don't really understand all of the nuances. So that's why I was asking, you know, what we were looking at here, because we're certainly not going to save money in the state general fund and we're, we're making, you know, potentially making judgments on local government, only looking at half of it. and. I question whether or not should, is this something, I mean, we certainly, I don't think, have authority at the state level to say you should, these two special districts should be combined, those two shouldn't. And wouldn't that, does that fit more under LAFCO or would, I mean, which really is the entity responsible, so. Well, uh, two, the questions two, I have. Two, two, two comments and then Ms. Huber. Uh, first of all, I think your first your your first point is actually I would read as encompassed in one a the need for special district reorganization. It, that that in fact could be uh, an area where the LAO would would look at it and say special districts, by and large or in some category, are the most efficient service deliverer that that there is compared to cities or counties or or other options. So, but we're not giving any criteria. So we're telling them to look at special districts, but we're not s asking them to, comp we're, not giving at, we're not going any deeper with criteria in terms of, of how we want them to evaluate. Or it's mm, we tried to simplify, yes, we tried to simplify this because the concern raised earlier was that it, it was uh, too directed. So we tried to, and we actually, in the meeting with p interested parties went back toward a more general characterization. Um, and to the second point, we may not save money for the state general fund. We may not be able to order uh, anything to happen directly. It doesn't, that doesn't mean it's not in the interest of our constituents and local citizens, number one, which is co certainly within the purview of the, of the committee. And secondly, it doesn't mean the legislature couldn't incentivize certain activities if it felt that that was justified or, or merited. So. And, and where do you feel that the discussion with LAO about the Department of Environment lacked the discussion or concern that you just outlined about the Local issue. Well, I think it, it, 
everyone probably has their own LAFCO story. I mean, it, we, we have, we have, that's right. We have 58 different LAFCOs. So, but, but, but we also recognize that, that Cal LAFCO is doing some work and I think that's complementary to, to what we're suggesting here. Ms. Hubert. If I may uh, do two things. Number one, I want to compliment the chair uh, for trying to include all of the members of the committee in your thinking um, about recommendations and about further actions. But if I may make a suggestion, um, it's really within the power of the chair to take all of the actions that are in this recommendation and bring it back to the committee. And I'd hate to see us uh, get sidetracked in kind of the minutia of how you go collect data to make decisions and to present to the committee and because one member wasn't there is there uh, it, it is certainly within the right of all of us as members of the committee to communicate directly with the chair about what direction we'd like you to go in um, but I would hesitate against having a vote of the committee on these recommendations since they all are within the power of you as the chair of the committee um, to take that direction. So I just wanted to make that suggestion. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Ms. Mitchell? No. Oh. <laughs> I'm just aiming point. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> well it, uh, uh, it is uh, absolutely true that any one of us can make these and other requests of, of LAO, Ledge Council. Um, the effort here was to try to reflect because I think it, it, it adds heft to the request to have it made by, by the committee. If the committee doesn't wish to go in this direction, that's, that's the committee's will. Mr. Bach. Yeah, if in the alternative the chair decides to write a letter that contains these recommendations, I will, for one, gladly sign on to that letter. I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Cook, I think, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I, I remember the earlier hearings we had. And, uh, uh, I'm sure the chair and everybody on this committee, they must feel like S Solomon and how they're gonna slice the baby here. And and that's what we do here. And the, the, the problem that I have, and uh, you know, I got some of my my special districts, they just drive me crazy. And then I have other ones which are absolutely fantastic. They're they're better than, than the, uh, for a variety of reasons. And they have very, very strong local support uh, I mentioned to my colleague that if I uh, probably disbanded one of them, I'd uh, uh, be recalled probably within uh, the, the, the scope of the next election. I'll probably be recalled for something else anyway. But uh, wh when you start meddling like this uh, without a fix and local control, uh, particularly in the, the climate, um, you know, I, I do want to consolidate some of the the smaller, less efficient ones, and, and part of it is a state problem because we have these state mandates that are coming down. You got to do this, 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 and they're having a tough time surviving. So part of it is our our own fault up here, I think. But uh, I do have some reservations um, on uh, on how we start meddling with this. But on the uh, on the other side, you know, we've had discussions, and I appreciate uh, it, uh, your attempt to. Uh, to herd cats here. Uh, th this is gonna be uh, very, very difficult because uh, we all have different apples and oranges and when we start talking about uh, common denominators, it's very, very difficult, so. Thank you, right. Mr. Cook. A any other comments? It's the, it's the, it's the chair's, uh, it's, the, it's the chair's judgment. We have more cats outside the corral than in. Uh, and so, um, therefore, uh, We'll uh, let these recommendations um, pass as a committee item and I'll take Mr. Block's suggestion. Uh, we'll circulate recommendations that the chair intends to forward to, uh, to LAO and Ledge Council and any member of the committee who wants to sign on is certainly going to be invited to do that. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that consideration, Mr. Chairman. I, well, I appreciate that. I, you can tell that there's a diverse group of opinions here and experiences with the uh, special districts and uh, some of us are very protective and of uh, local government and of the success that our special districts have had in uh, s providing the services at want. As a uh, one issue I wanted to jump back to if I can make a request of you and that's regarding going forward and working together as a team here uh, as a member, all members of the committee being equal, um, that all of us and or our designated staff individual have the access when we do meet with stakeholders to attend those meetings and that no one 
or no committee um, members designee be excluded if um, they feel they being the individual member feels that it's important for them themselves or their staff member to be in attendance at a meeting and I would request that of the chair to uh, have staff open open the door to all the members if they wish to attend stakeholder meetings we will have we can have some further discussion about that thank you um, I think we don't need to talk about that in the committee meeting uh, okay uh, we'll I don't think we have any further business to come before us um, we have a couple members who <coughs> didn't get a chance to vote on uh, uh, Mr. Lara's bill, so we'll, uh, we'll leave it open for 10 minutes.